So good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you from ISRM family. Welcome you all. So I'll be just giving you a overview of the surgical aspect of cosmetic gynecology as we'll be dealing with the individual topic in detail as we move onward in the sessions. So to begin with, female genital cosmetic surgery is defined as surgical alteration of vulvovaginal anatomy intended for cosmesis in women who have no apparent structural or functional abnormality. And we all are very clear about it. It is with no apparent structural or functional abnormality. Genital cosmetic surgery will not refer to procedures performed for clinical indication anyhow. The operations themselves, however, are really not new. But the only new thing is the concept that women may individually wish to alter their external genitalia for appearance or functional reason or just to enhance their sexual pleasure. As per the ACOG Committee Opinion 2007, the patient should be made aware that the procedures or surgery to alter the sexual appearance are not medically indicated. Women should be informed about the lack of high quality data about the effectiveness of cosmetic surgical procedures, counseling about the potential complications like scarring, altered sensation, need for reoperation, this perunia should be done prior. Gynecologists should be sufficiently trained to recognize the sexual dysfunction. Media advertising, let me repeat, media advertising must be accurate and not misleading anyhow. However, after this 2007 declaration by Ostrensky in 2011, uh, declaration, Ostrensky in 2011 published extensive evidence-based work on effectiveness and reliability of cosmetic gynecology procedures and concluded that ACOG recommendation did not comply with scientific norms and were not sufficiently transparent. In 2013, RCOG and ACOG agreed that women should be given accurate information about normal variation in genital anatomy and advertisement of female genital cosmetic surgery should not be misleading women on what is considered normal or what is possible with surgery. Despite that, we all have seen, we all have witnessed in past one or two decades, there is high tide of cosmetic gynecology. And why is this so? I feel why not? If a woman can wish for breast augmentation or reduction or abdominoplasty or blepharoplasty, then why not vulvovaginal cosmetic procedures? Ugly, floppy, loose, sticky, open and difficult orgasm are some of the common presentations, some of the common complaints that we come across our OPD practice. Cosmetic procedures are an opportunity for individuals to make physical change in appearance correct self-perceived defect, change how they look, address any physical problem or discomfort, enhance their self-esteem and look better in clothes or improve their sexual or orgasmic pleasure. So the common terminology that we come across in cosmetic gynecology may include either female genital plastic cosmetic surgery or female cosmetic genital surgery, vulvovaginal aesthetic surgery, cosmetic plastic gynecology, aesthetic vaginal surgery or vaginal rejuvenation per se. No one specific term is accepted to describe these procedure. However, FGPS is the most commonly used term. So we must have seen just a brief revision, the external genitalia, the surgical, the important surgical landmarks that you should know are the extent of labia majora and minora, clitoris, prepuce. So these are the landmarks which we should be aware before we go for any surgical procedure. From surgery point of view, perineum can grossly be divided into urogenital triangle anteriorly and anal triangle posteriorly. The perineal membrane divides the urogenital triangle into superficial and deep perineal space. So as we all know, labia majora, it corresponds to scrotum in men. The normal length measured from the crura of the clitoris to the posterior fascia is somewhere between 7 to 12 centimeters, on an average 9.3 centimeters. The fascia over the fat pad below the squamous epithelium is Coley's fascia. Tearing of this layer results in laxity and skin fold. So this is the most important covering 
sheath which provides the tensile strength. Talking about labia minora, the normal length and width from the base to the edge of labia minora are 60.6 millimeter and 21.8 millimeter, the range being 20 to 100 millimeter respectively. Now, there are no formal guidelines to indicate when surgical correction is required for labial hypertrophy. However, we have certain reported literature stating that labial hypertrophy can be taken as a maximum distance from base to edge greater than four centimeters. Labia minora, it contains sensitive nerve fibers and generous vasculature. During sexual arousal, labia minora becomes engorged and contribute to erotic sensation and pleasure. So important landmark again is Hart's line, which divides labial mucosa from the squamous epithelium within the vestibule within the vulva vestibule. Now we'll be taking up all these surgeries, all these anatomy in detail as we move ahead. Just to brief you, clitoris, it is composed of three erectile tissue components, the glans, body, and the crura. It is derived from the genital tubercle, which corresponds ontologically to male penis. The body and the glans of clitoris are covered by prepuce or hood. The average length and breadth of clitoris is 19.1 millimeter and 5.1 millimeter respectively, but the variations are considerable and acceptable. The distance between clitoris and urethra is, is 28.5 millimeter on an average. So during the arousal, clitoris respond to neurotransmitter mediated vascular smooth muscle relaxation. As a result, it increases in length, diameter, from the engorgement. The primer, the vascular supply primarily is from two arterial sources which supply labia minora. An understanding of this vascular anatomy may relate to placement of incision line during a labial surgery. Entering anteriorly, the vasculature is derived from external pudendal artery, obturator artery, and funicular artery. The posterior supply is by internal pudendal artery. The laterals from these sources run perpendicular to the long axis of the labia with the confluence beneath the labial edge. So few words about the somatic innervation. Pudendal nerve, which is uh, the main nerve in the genital area, originating from the S2 to S4, innervates the pelvic floor musculature. It is divided into dorsal nerve of clitoris and perineal nerve at the, at the level of superficial perineal fascia. The internal rectal nerve, a branch of pudendal nerve, supplies the external and the, the external anal sphincter. So the com commonly performed surgeries when we talk about cosmetic gynecology includes labioplasty, hoodplasty, perineoplasty, vaginoplasty, hymenoplasty, and menosplasty. So before we go ahead with any surgery, in cosmetic gynae or otherwise too, the paramount thing is patient selection and the rationale. As it is well said that female genitals vary in appearance as much as snowflakes. Patients should understand that normally there is an impressive variation in labial and vaginal size. Even though she notes a room from, for improvement, she is quite normal and healthy just as she is. So do's and don'ts are always important. So whom to operate on and whom not to operate on are the key take home points. So whom to operate on? Educated, informed patient who understand their alternatives. Patients who have an isolated complaint related to the genital area. The patient themselves and not their partner or professional advisor should generate their rationale for surgical procedure. Patients should understand that genital tissue is really smooth and regular prior to the surgery and that it, that it will not be so alter even after the surgical procedure. She cannot expect perfection, exact symmetry or a specific outcome. As it is strictly an elective surgery, high risk patients like smokers, uncontrolled diabetics, psychologically unstable individuals, and women with serious or multiple medical disorder should be screened for the same before we take them up for any surgical procedure. Most important, whom not to operate on. Women who expect surgery will correct surgical sexual dysfunction per se. So isolated sexual dysfunction, 
we should be very clear while we are counseling that the dysfunction, if it is because of some other origin, origin and not because of structural variation, she may not be relieved post-surgery. Patients with body dysmorphic disorder or any eating disorder, patient with unreasonable expectation, patients who come with a photograph or want to look exactly like that, patients with untreated anxiety disorder. So kindly screen your patient before you take them up for any surgical procedure. Let's start with labioplasty. So labioplasty is surgical alteration in size and shape of labia. It was described first time in 1984 and it is the most commonly performed genital cosmetic surgery. Remember that labioplasty should not be done on girls younger than 18 years because labia continues to develop beyond puberty into early adulthood. It violates federal law in some countries if it is performed in girls younger than 18 years. Labioplasty can be grouped as augmentation labioplasty or reduction, augmenta or reduction labioplasty. Augmentation plasty is done for augmentation of labia majora to create a more full and symmetric look either by autologous fat transplantation or by using fillers. Whereas reduction plasty can be minoroplasty or majoroplasty. If you talk about labia minora, the protrusion of labia minora beyond labia majora with cosmetic, hygienic, sexual, and functional ramification are the most common reason for surgical intervention. So talking about the indication, this is the first common indication. Discomfort in clothing and chaffing, this is the common complaint that we hear here in OPD. Girls who are mostly who are active in sports, they may come up with such complaints. Discomfort while taking part in sport, as I was mentioning, and entry dyspareunia. Several techniques have been described to affect cosmetic alteration of labia minora. Each has its own proponents and rationale. The commonly used techniques are linear resection, wedge resection. The old ones may include deapatherization, flap technique, and Z-plasty. The procedure removing more liberal portion of labia and clitoral head epithelium pair considerably poorer than more conservative approach. So always undercut, don't overcut. Remember that. The paramount is, the, the, what you should remember, the paramount importance is the mantra, the right procedure for the right patient for the right reason. Before we take any lady for any cosmetic gynec procedure, for any cosmetic gynae procedure, a preoperative artwork is mandatory. Uh, remember that uh, a line should be drawn on both mucosal and lateral surface, taking care that taking care mucosally to stay lateral to the heart's line and on the lateral labial surface to be at least half to one centimeter medial to the inner labial fold in the linear resection technique. So we'll be taking all these things in detail. So once you have done the marking, what is important in linear resection is the cutting, which includes the finest technique. Now why I was mentioning being conservative? Since the tone of squamous epithelium of labia is greater than the mucosa, if too generously excised, little or no labia may remain and mucosa will retract outward, giving the amputation look and discomfort. As you can see in the image, this can look like a genital amputation or mutilation. So once you have done the procedure, uh, I'm not going into the detail of the procedure as we'll be taking them individually. The, the skin closure has to be mainly by 4-0 to 6-0 sutures. The subcutaneous by 3-0 to 5-0. Monofilament absorbable sutures are the most preferred one. So advantages is, uh, it is uh, the linear resection in small and we get a relatively straight and even looking labia. Now these are few before and after result when we talk about linear resection. Wedge technique, again, it is a better technique in good hands. It needs more clinical expertise. Care should be taken not to stray too deeply into the mucosa medially and to be sure to upcurve the lateral V wedge incision line and to avoid dog ears. Periodic mattress sutures are preferred over continuous suturing. So the advantage, again, with the wedge technique is a more natural looking, uh, I'm just overshooting the time, few more minutes. So advantages being more natural looking leading edge, 
potentially less interruption with the nerve supply, better aesthetic, better aesthetic. Disadvantage, the longer learning curve, great risk of wound dehiscence. So these are certain before and after images. Z plasty and the wedge and other uh, deepetherization techniques are, re are of late uh, not being practiced. Just few post-op care points. Post-op pain is uncommon. Some degree of asymmetric swelling or bruising may be seen. The main goal of post-op treatment is to reduce edema as soon as possible as persistent edema may cause wound dehiscence. Take I think... Take home message. Take home message. Take home message. Yeah, just a thing. Uh, okay. So I just uh, wish you did that. So take home message, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was you did the time. Take home message, proper patient selection, good pre-operative evaluation, right surgical technique and experienced surgeon. Always remember the conservative approach. The line between medically necessary operations such as vaginal or pelvic reconstructive surgery and elective surgery such as vaginoplasty and labioplasty are blurring and can now, both of them can be now performed at the same time. Both function and beauty are being addressed together and not separately. There are no techniques specific for re-operations. Evaluate the patient anatomy, her post-operative ideal desire, and then design a procedure to meet these goals. Thank you. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you.